So this is a pretty standard apologetic approach of imagining a scenario that resolves the concern. And so the other day I made a video calling out Dan's horrible arguments against traditional gospel authorship and he has posted a response. I won't be able to engage with everything Dan, Dan says because it was a 10 minute video, but I wanted to start with this clip because it perfectly showcases Dan's rhetorical strategy. Dan's rhetorical strategy is to present an argument or a piece of data which he thinks supports the anonymity of the gospel, such as the text not containing explicit statements about their authorship. Then when I point out that this piece of data does not support the theory of gospel anonymity because this was normal of ancient Greco-Roman biographies and is therefore equally to be expected under traditional authorship, he accuses me of imagining and ginning up apologetic escapes for the data and this is asinine and shows that Dan fundamentally does not understand how evidence or probability works. Something constitutes evidence if it renders one explanation more probable than the others. Imagine I came up to you and I said, hey, did you know that the pyramids were made by aliens? And if you ask me for evidence, suppose I said, oh, well, the pyramids are tall. This would be a horrible argument. And you might point out to me that the pyramids being tall is just as consistent with them being made by humans as it is with them being made by aliens. Like Them being made by humans or be them being man made by aliens, that doesn't affect the probability of the pyramids being tall. You would essentially argue that them being tall is no more likely on the alien hypothesis than if they were made by humans. But imagine I responded to that, you know, critique of my evidence by saying, ah, there you go, ginning up apologetic escapes to avoid your dogma. No, that's not a refutation of the issue I presented. But this is no different than what Dan is doing with most of his arguments for gospel anonymity. He presents a piece of data as if it supports his position. But then when I point out that the data is not at all surprising under traditional authorship, he just does this rhetorical move where he acts as if his theory is the default, and then he plays the skeptic towards any other position. Dan accuses me of creating imaginary scenarios, but that's what he's doing. He has created an imaginary scenario where the gospels were anonymous anonymous until the second century, and he acts as if that is the default position, and he just accuses his opponents as engaging in apologetics anytime they point out flaws in the data he tries to use as evidence for that position. When I point out that it was normal in ancient Greco-Roman book culture to have tags or known patrons or book covers, he accuses me of imaginary scenarios which avoid the concern. But this is question begging, as it assumes that there is a concern in the first place. Dan is viewing the lack of explicit mention of authorship in the text as a problem for traditional authorship. And when I point out that this is not surprising, he accuses me of imagining scenarios when he should be recognizing that these aspects of ancient book culture show that there is not a concern in the first place as the data he provides is no more problematic on my theory than it is on his. It's also important to note how Dan shifts his arguments throughout our dialogue. When it comes to the question of whether the Gospels were anonymous, there are three positions you could take. You could affirm the Gospels were originally anonymous, as Dan does. You could affirm that the Gospels were not anonymous, as I do, or you could affirm that the evidence is just insufficient to say one way or another. In Dan's original video, he is arguing for the position that the Gospels were anonymous, but now he has switched his argument and is playing the skeptic towards my arguments for traditional authorship. Even if all of my arguments were unsuccessful, that still would not support Dan's position that the Gospels were anonymous originally. That would just leave us with uncertainty on the topic. But by making this rhetorical shift where Dan is now attacking arguments arguments for traditional authorship, he is distracting from how utterly garbage his arguments for anonymity are. And I want to point this out to my listeners because it's an important to note these rhetorical shifts throughout a dialogue. Throughout Dan's response, he constantly repositions the window of the dialogue to make it look like, oh, there's this big problem for traditional authorship and this silly apologist is just inventing things to get around it. Whereas what is actually going on is Dan is trying to say that there's a big problem for traditional authorship and I and many biblical scholars are just pointing out that the big problem is a figment of your imagination. You should assume that the Gospels were published and transmitted according to the normal conventions of Greco-Roman biography. Therefore, the authorship would have been known, even if it was not internal to the text. But we have to overlook the fact that in violation of those very conventions that would achieve that very result, the colophons or the other identification of authorship was not transmitted. We have no data 
indicating that. So this is a silly argument as if the Gospels are ancient Greco-Roman biographies and we know that the production of biographies in this time followed a certain convention of having names attached to them through covers or tags. The most rational inference is that when the Gospels were produced, they also followed the normal conventions of their time. Dan has the burden for showing that this norm was absent in the production of the Gospels as his theory goes against what was usually practiced, whereas my theory is in a locked step with what we know about the ancient world. Dan says that we don't have any of these colophons in existence, but this is problematic as an argument for two reasons. First, as I pointed out, us lacking these would not change the fact that this was the norm. And second, the fact that every manuscript we have, which includes the beginning of the gospel, is one which attributes traditional authorship. Dan has no leg to stand on here. The author uses the first person plural to distinguish themselves from the beloved disciple who is explicitly referred to in the third person singular. Dan says that the beloved disciple would not write about himself by saying we know his testimony is true. However, this fails to recognize that it is normal for ancient writers and even modern writers to describe events that they witnessed by using the third person. And it is normal for a single writer to say we. Thus, his attempts to argue that John 21, 24 are more problematic under the theory of anonymity are unsuccessful because this data is just as consistent with traditional authorship. This is again comes from just knowing what was conventional in ancient writings. Clement of Alexandria is writing in the late second century CE after traditional authorship has been assigned. The question here is when this authorship was assigned. We have numerous sources in the second century which agree on the authorship of the Gospels and these writers come from all over the Roman Empire. They range from modern day Turkey, Italy, France, and Egypt and this was all before the methods of instant communication that we have today, such as email and text. As New Testament scholar Brant Petra notes in his book, The Case for Jesus, quote, the second major problem with the theory of the anonymous gospels is the utter implausibility that a book circulating around the Roman Empire without a title for almost a hundred years could somehow at some point be attributed to exactly the same author by scribes throughout the world and yet leave no trace of disagreement in any manuscript. And by the way, this is supposed to have happened not just once, but with each of the four Gospels, end quote. New Testament scholar Graham Stanton also notes, quote, as soon as Christian communities regularly used more than one written account of the actions and teachings of Jesus, it would have been necessary to distinguish them by some form of title, especially in the context of readings at worship, end quote. Thus, Dan's theory of authorship being attributed for the first time in the second century and is somehow becoming universal and uncontested is implausible, implausible on a variety of levels in traditional authorship does not face this issue. Papius' statement cannot be reasonably understood this way because the statement is explicitly that it was not written in the order that Christ said or did these things. So here Dan is misrepresenting Papius again. I will read the relevant section. Quote, Mark, having become Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately everything he remembered, though not in order, of the things either said or done by the Lord. End quote. Dan is here assuming that though not in order is to be understood as communicating that these things were were not written in the order that these things were said. However, this could also be understood as saying Mark wrote down things said or done by the Lord and that what he wrote down was not in order. Dan is assuming the former, which the text does not dictate. The text of Papias says that Peter presented the Lord's work in sayings and that what Mark wrote down was not in order. If you want to argue that this means Mark wrote down a sayings gospel that was not in chronological order, you have the burden of proof for showing that interpretation is the correct one as you have not done that so far you have just reasserted your position my interpretation is not any more implausible than yours so if you want to present this as a problem to my view you need to show what is wrong with my interpretation that I've offered I will note that in my past dialogues with Dan I have referenced a paper by F.H. Coulson who argues this position and Dan's response to that paper was to simply say I don't care that paper is old way to put data over dogma Dan so again Judas's death, we have an account that's supposed to be directly from Matthew. If I'm going to make a comment here regarding Papias' remarks on Judas's death, since Dan harps on this a lot.
plot, the section describing Judas is surrounded by textual issues as the only surviving portion of this text is from a lost 4th century commentary and its remains are scattered quotations from later writers. But scholar Stephen Carlson argues that the remarks about Judas having a bloated flesh is a sensational hyperbolic description which was to highlight the moral depravity of Judas, not to give a literal description of Judas at his death. So all of this weight that Dan is putting on this as an objection to Papias is silly.